a little bit of physiology coming up for you. It's, it's not too daunting. And if you have your pens and papers out, you can sort of make a couple of notes. But th this is important for you guys to understand. We're going to stay with our example of the two-hour bike ride. So when we go on a two-hour bike ride, the majority of the calories that you are burning come from carbohydrate. You certainly burn some fat, and depending on intensity, you'll burn less or more fat. But our coal, as it comes, our finite fuel source that we really burn through as an endurance athlete is carbohydrate. On a, on a bike ride, we might, you know, someone my size, 200 pounds, or I might burn anywhere between 700 and 1200 calories every hour on a bike ride or a, or a few more on a run. A smaller person might burn somewhere between 500 and 1,000 calories. So we burn through a lot of fuel on every single time that we're exercising or going through a session. Well, the type of carbohydrate that we burn as an athlete, and we'll use for our example because the numbers aren't that important as we talk, but we'll use an example that I'm burning 750 calories an hour. So going on my 200 200 um, or two hour bike ride, um, that's about a 1500 calorie bike ride. Well, a lot of those calories that we're burning are carbohydrate. And the type of carbohydrate that we sort of view as our coal or our fuel is glycogen. And, so, you know, you've probably heard of glycogen. Uh, plenty of people don't actually know what it means. It's very simple. Glycogen is just stored form of carbohydrate. That's all it is, stored form of carbohydrate. Now, we store glycogen in two places in the body. We store it in the liver and in the muscle. Okay, so we store glycogen in the liver and the muscle. For the sake of this discussion, we can sort of ignore the liver glycogen, uh, sometimes used in exercise, in, in longer endurance events and maybe competition. But our, our primary use of liver glycogen is actually feeding our brain and other organs when we're asleep at night. So that's what we, we store about four or 500 calories. It's our sort of sleep food, if you want to call it that. Our muscle glycogen, um, our muscles are a little bit like sponges. We can, we can store so much glycogen. I might be able to store somewhere around 2,000 calories worth of muscle glycogen. A uh, smaller person, maybe just 1,500 calories. <laughs> but they're a little bit like sponges. Once they're saturated, they're not, you can't put any more. You, you can't, once the bucket is full, you can't add, load any more glycogen on top of it. And that's pretty important to understand. Now, and here's something to put in your minds for a little bit later. We're going to come back to this. Muscle glycogen, that is really our primary fuel source, our big coal that, that we're going to sort of feed our fire, feed our endurance sport from. Muscle glycogen gets depleted in two scenarios and only two scenarios during exercise and during starvation. Those are the two scenarios, and that's going to be important for later on. This is really what, what this sort of uh, the approach to fueling is based on. We, uh, we only deplete muscle glycogen if you're starved or during activity. So just, just put that in the back of your mind as we sort of go through to this. Let, let, let's sort of uh, think about replenishing glycogen or putting, taking the carbohydrates that we eat and storing them as glycogen, liver glycogen or muscle glycogen. <clears throat> when, when you eat carbohydrates, doesn't matter whether we're talking about Cliff Shots or Power Gels or Gatorade or pasta, potatoes, sweet potatoes, fruits, vegetables, breads, pastas, everything that is carbohydrate. When you eat carbohydrate, you absorb it through the stomach and to, to to, to very much simplify a string of physiological things that occur, chain of events that occur, as you synthesize that carbohydrate that you eat, there is a, a sort of a metaphorical sort of fork in the road that under certain circumstances, you will take that carbohydrate and you will store it as glycogen. Under different circumstances, you will take that carbohydrate and store it as the less appealing fat. Those are the two things that can occur when you eat carbohydrate. Now, that's pretty interesting because as you think about sort of that Midwestern that we talked about earlier, you eat carbohydrates, it can get stored as fat. Well, here's an interesting thing. The carbohydrates that you eat, and this is just a physiological fact, the carbohydrates that you eat, the body is 
very much more effective or efficient at taking those carbohydrates that you eat and storing it as glycogen when your metabolic rate is high. It's extremely inefficient at taking those carbohydrates and storing it as uh, muscle glycogen when your metabolic rate is low. Well, we just talked about in our fueling window, we have a high metabolic rate. We have an elevated metabolic rate. And that's exactly the time, especially post-exercise, that our body is extremely efficient at taking carbohydrate and storing it as glycogen. Very, very efficient. But outside of that fueling window, sitting around on the couch in the early evening, if you've done a morning workout, your body is extremely inefficient at taking carbohydrate and storing it as glycogen. In fact, if you dump a bunch of carbohydrate in there, there's um, some of it will get synthesized as muscle glycogen, but predominantly it will actually get transferred and stored as fat. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. So let's come back to our two hour bike ride again. We've already discussed that that's a 1500 calorie deficit. You're going through 750 calories an hour, give or take. You're going to finish that bike ride and you're going to be in big deficit. Well, to do your fueling window correctly, for you to succeed as an athlete on every workout, you want to, at least philosophically, you want to exit that fueling window. In other words, about 90 minutes after the end of that exercise, maybe up to two hours, you want to exit that fueling window with a zero deficit of calories. Philosophically, you probably won't get there, uh, and that's fine. But at least philosophically, when you approach your fueling, that should be sort of the stated objective. Now, you might be thinking, goodness me, that is a, a huge amount of calories. Do you mean that I have to stuff myself like a foie gras goose as soon as I finish exercise? Well, <laughs> yes and no. The um, Part of the reason that we take calories in during activity, and you've already heard, you know, taking 100, 200, 300, up to 400 calories every hour, during activity. Well, one of the reasons that that's actually a pretty good thing to do is if on the course of a two hour bike ride, I managed to take in 250 calories each hour and we're using our 1500 calorie bike ride as the example. When I finish that bike ride, well, I've certainly achieved my goal of supporting that bike ride with proper nutrition. But on top of that, I'm finishing that bike ride with much less of a deficit. And it gives me a fighting opportunity to get closer towards that zero deficit that we're sort of aiming for at the end. If we don't eat any calories during the bike ride and we do have a 1,500 calorie deficit, it's very, very hard to, to eat 1,500 calories following a workout. And, and even if you did, it wouldn't be a greater thing to do anyway, because while our rate of synthesis is, is greatly improved as we have this metabolic rate that is high, it's that there's still, imagine sort of dumping food or liquid into a funnel, there is still a rate of synthesis that occurs. And if you just dump it all in at once, a lot of it will get spilled over and stored as fat, to use sort of simple lay terms. <coughs> so we want to fuel during the workout, yes, for performance, but also to allow us to finish the workout with less, less of a deficit. No matter how well you fuel during that workout, it becomes clear that the feeding that you have immediately following any workout is the most important feeding of your day. And the feeding that you should focus on or the types of food that you should focus on immediately following every workout should be predominantly carbohydrate. About three quarters of the calorie makeup of that food that you're taking in should be predominantly carbohydrate. If you have a particularly long or a particularly hard workout where you are creating a massive deficit, you may want to try and support yourself with a, um, a recovery drink, which occurs sort of essentially zero minutes, zero to five minutes after the end of activity. But all you're doing there is still sort of replenishing the deficit. Still, even if you do have a recovery drink, I, I like to have athletes have real food, uh, carbohydrate focused, within the next 30 to 60 minutes following activity. That should be the mission. And it becomes critically important. So on longer and harder rides or runs or swims, we're drip feeding calories throughout the workout, potentially having some form of recovery drink or additional calories. And then we're having a real feed with predominantly carbohydrate. 
if we do that well, if we do that well, we will be relatively close to a zero deficit. And what we have done is, yes, during that bike ride or during that training session, we have depleted muscle glycogen, but we have done the best job that we possibly can of replenishing that muscle glycogen.